is now 105. So it's a real pleasure to welcome Anant Madabushi, who's going to be telling us about uh, both deep learning methods and non deep learning methods for uh, image analysis. We spent the first few lectures of the term talking about how uh, deep learning and convolutional neural networks and many other architectures have revolutionized the way that we can interpret images, but also videos and temporal uh, ways and how these have been applied to so many different domains of uh, imaging. Today, we're starting the module on medical image analysis. And I think what we're going to hear from Anant is that we, we basically have both room for new deep learning methods, but also that a lot of the specialized methodologies where the features are actually handcrafted through decades of expertise have perhaps not yet been surpassed by deep learning methods, and maybe they will not be. So we're intrigued to see sort of deep learning in the context of traditional imaging. And uh, Anand, take it away. Yeah, th thank you, Manolis. But you just gave you gave the punchline away, so I think it's pretty much done. So yeah, that's, the, <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that's that's a great summary. That's a great executive summary of of the the essence of the talk. No, but thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm glad this this time worked out. Um, so I uh, I wanted to uh, you know just stir the pot a little bit with this. Um, hopefully, what will be uh, in um, uh, you know, at least a, a mildly provocative talk in the uh, in, in the computational pathology space, and I deliberately chose this title because in in the domain that I work in, uh, which is uh, like Manolis mentioned in the medical image analysis space, but specifically in the area of pathology, where you've got a lot of large images, and with the digitization of pathology over the last two decades, it's really become one of the hottest areas for application of deep learning, quite simply because the amount of data that one can avail of supersedes by orders of magnitude anything that you could get in the radiology space, such as an MRI or CT scans. There's just so much, even on a single biopsy slide. Uh, and so it really has become the, uh, the almost poster child for application of deep learning. But that's why I want to stir the pot a little bit. And even in these cases where you've got these gargantuan images really talk and qualify where the opportunity for deep learning is and where it may not be appropriate and some of the caveats and and some of some of missteps along the way um, that I want to sort of really share with the group um, I'm not going to dive really into the technical minutiae with sort of how to construct networks or you know hyperparameter optimization and so on but try to give some some lessons learned um, and, and some, some sort of suggestions and thoughts on how and where deep learning could potentially be most useful in, in the context, at least for computational pathology. Uh, so just want to just, uh, just call out, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on the faculty at, uh, at Case Western, but also uh, a research health scientist with the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA. Uh, and a lot of the technologies we're developing, uh, the goal really is to impact favorably and positively the health of our, our veterans. So um, I don't know if any of you are on social media. Um, if you are, well, this is my, my true conflict of interest disclosure, the fact that I have a social media account. And so that's, uh, that's my Twitter handle. So if, if you guys are on Twitter, you like any of what you see here, please feel free to give me a follow. All right, uh, so I wanna set the stage a little bit with the clinical context. And I use here some of the statistics from cancer about the diagnostic incidence of cancer in, um, in somebody's lifetime. So if you look at men and women in the United States, about 40% of men and women in the United States will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. So that's a really staggering statistic, right? So four out of 10 people in the US, adult population will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. Uh, but when you actually look at the mortality on account of cancer, it's about 600,000 deaths, give or take, uh, you know, a uh, 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 couple of thousand. Uh, in the US every year. Now that's still a very large number. I don't mean to trivialize that number. It's still a large number. But when you look at that diagnostic incidence rate of 40% in the adult population, and you contrast that with about 600,000 deaths per year, clearly there's a discrepancy. Clearly there's a mismatch. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the reason is that we have become much better in the use of imaging upfront and early to identify cancer, 
uh, at a much earlier stage. And we know that the uh, earlier the defined cancer, the more likely you are to uh, be able to defeat it in a manner of speaking. Uh, we have uh, biomarkers at our disposal that we use more uh, aggressively. Uh, we also have better therapeutics like immunotherapy, which won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018, uh, which of course has really changed the landscape of how we treat cancers today. But if we are completely honest, we have to admit that at least part of the reason for the discrepancy between the diagnostic incidence of cancer and the mortality statistics for cancer is at least in part because for a lot of cancers, we tend to over-diagnose and over-treat them. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, let's take prostate cancer as one example. Prostate cancer is a cancer that affects one in seven men in the US in their lifetime, but only one in 40 will die on account of it. And so it's a classic example of a cancer that typically is very indolent. It's not aggressive, it's indolent. And unfortunately, even with that, we tend to overtreat these indolent cancers. We subject them to radiation therapy, to surgery, um, and those treatments very often can cause more harm than good because there are there, there is a, a non-zero uh, likelihood or probability that somebody who's getting treated aggressively for indolent prostate cancer could in turn then develop other uh, diseases. I mean, you could actually have bladder cancer develop on account of treating uh, prostate cancer, indolent prostate cancer with radiation therapy as an example. But beyond that, one of the other issues is the fact that um, there is also a very real issue of financial toxicity, that we tend to uh, you know, cause some real uh, harm to patients, not just on account of toxicity of the treatment, but also because this causes um, you know, uh, bankruptcy for a lot of individuals who are diagnosed with cancer, just because of the uh, you know, the, the way our financial, our, our health system is set up and the health economics in our country. And so the overdiagnosis and overtreatment directly contributes to the financial toxicity uh, for a, uh, a lot of cancer patients. And so in our group, we've really been thinking about what is the utility for artificial intelligence? What is the utility for machine learning uh, in the context of, um, you know, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment response assessment uh, for diseases like cancer? And there's a lot of buzz right now around you know, AI for disease diagnosis, so being able to identify the presence or absence of disease, but that's only part of the opportunity, um, uh, the way I think of it, because there's so much that needs to be done beyond the diagnosis. I mean, if you've got 40% of the population being diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime, then you really have to be thinking about what next, what happens after the cancer diagnosis. Now, how do you treat these cancers? How do you manage them? How do you identify which ones are aggressive, which ones are indolent, and then potentially prescribe the more aggressive versus the less aggressive therapy? And it's ultimately developing these what are called prognostic and predictive tools, more than the diagnostic tools, in my, my opinion, that will actually help us ultimately realize the true promise of precision medicine. Right? So that's really what of, a lot of what our group has been focused on. And I just want to quickly add here that uh, this is not to suggest that there aren't tools that already do this. Right? So there are a lot of other tools out there uh, that look at things like uh, you know, gene expression, uh, the, the genomics of the tumor, the proteomics of the tumor to try to understand whether it's more aggressive or less aggressive. Perhaps the most uh, well-known example of a companion diagnostic tool for identifying which patients uh, will require more aggressive therapy is the Oncotype DX assay. So the Oncotype DX is a multi-gene uh, expression-based assay from um, genomic health, now part of exact biosciences, that essentially was used to generate a risk score based on the expression of 22 different genes. And essentially, if you had a high risk score, then those patients were more aggressive, needed aggressive treatments like chemotherapy. If you had low score that came out of this uh, set of 22 different genes, here's the equation, then you had less aggressive disease, and uh, low score also meant that you probably uh, would benefit from just surgery. You don't need the chemotherapy, right? So that was the idea. But we know that a lot of these genomic or gene expression-based assays have limitations because they're expensive, they're tissue destructive, they destroy the tissue to do the gene expression profiling. And also the other problem is that they involve sampling a part of the tumor that tends to be more aggressive. Uh, that, well, they, they, they may involve sampling a part of the tumor that is not the most aggressive component of the tumor. Uh, because of the problem of intratumoral heterogeneity, we know that 
Very aggressive tumors tend to be extremely heterogeneous morphologically. They tend to have multiple uh, subclones, multiple different types of mutations. So if you don't sample the most aggressive component of the tumor with these gene expression-based assays, then you may not get a risk score that truly reflects the most aggressive potential of the tumor. So that's a basic challenge with these assays. And like I said, with digital pathology, with the ability to digitize slides, now you have the opportunity to create images like this. This is a standard go-to slide for a pathologist. Right? So a pathologist is the one who looks at the slides. Once a biopsy is done, a slide is created, and the slide is looked at by a pathologist. Pathologist renders a diagnosis of you know, is this cancer not cancer? What is the address? You know, what, what is the grade or the stage of the disease? All of this was typically done under a microscope. But in the last two decades with whole slide scanning, the fact that you can put these slides into a scanner, generate high resolution images like the ones that you see here, means that pathologists can render the diagnosis based on you know, looking at an image on a screen. But more than that, for data scientists, computer scientists, uh, and bioengineers like us, we have an opportunity now to start to employ advanced machine learning image analysis, computer vision approaches to these pathology slides to start to ask, are there features, are there patterns that go beyond what can be visually discerned by a human reader, by a pathologist, right? So just an example of some of the kinds of patterns that a pathologist may not be able to visually discern. Uh, with machine learning, we can identify individual cells, individual lymphocytes, uh, individual cancer cells, the ones, the, the red dots that you see here. Uh, we can uh, then use uh, ideas from network theory uh, to essentially look at the spatial architecture and the graphical arrangement of the individual cells. And, and we can look at a series of different quantitative metrics from the spatial arrangement of the individual cells. We can start to look at textual patterns within the different tissue compartments, within the epithelium, within the stroma, within the different types of cells, and convert all of this into a series of different quantitative measurements that could then tell us not just about diagnosis, but also prognosis of the disease, and also critically whether somebody is going to respond to a particular treatment or whether they're not going to respond to a particular treatment. Now, can you yeah. go back to that slide for a second? So sure. I, I'm having trouble understanding what we're seeing right. here. So basically, where does the cell end and where does just the space desolation, uh, you know? Or that's, a great, that's a great question. Thank, uh, thank you for that. So, these little red dots represent what are called uh, you know, cancer nuclei or lymphocytes. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the, the bread and butter uh, slide that you would have um, for uh, a, a cancer diagnosis. Um, what you're seeing here, uh, these, these particular structures here with, um, with the white in between and the, um, you know, the, the, the purple borders, these are tubules, right? Uh, and this is sort of one of the hallmarks. These tubules are essentially the tubes that connect uh, different parts of the uh, organ essentially serve as the, uh, the, the food network uh, and the nutrient network. And so when you do a sectioning of the specimen, uh, you're essentially getting a transverse view. Uh, but really what we're looking at here with the spatial arrangement are the, the things that the red, the red dots, which have been identified by the machine learning, these are the cancer nuclei, the lymphocytes, that's what we're looking at. So the, the idea here is to look at that spatial arrangement of these cancer cells and cancer nuclei. I'll talk a little bit about this in more detail subsequently, um, but that's sort of what specifically is being focused on here. And then the rest is just nearest neighbor intersection. Yeah. So, correct. So we're looking, well, there are multiple different ways in which we can quantify the spatial arrangement. You can, you know, we've, we've looked at, for instance, Voronoi tessellations. You can look at Deloney triangulations. Yeah. You can look at a series of different spatial statistics uh, to capture that interplay, right? Okay. okay, so so why why is this important? So like um, like Nolis, uh, you know, uh, alluded to in the in the introduction, you know, there's a huge opportunity now with looking at just these images to try to uh, figure out what the outcome and what the treatment response of patients might be. So there's a huge latent opportunity that instead of having the genomic based tests, you could have these images digitized. They run through the, uh, the, the algorithm and the algorithm then looks at patterns and these patterns are able to now suggest which of these patients are likely to have more aggressive disease versus less aggressive disease and therefore which patients need chemotherapy versus those patients who don't need the chemotherapy, right? So why is this, why is this really uh, great? Because you're not destroying any tissue, right? You're taking a slide that the pathologist looks at 
you digitize it using this digitizer, and now you have a digital slide image. You don't destroy tissue. You can, um, you, you, you can essentially run this on the cloud. You can generate um, the pattern recognition, the image and ass assessment, and send the results back to the oncologist. Right? So that's the opportunity. So where does deep learning fit into all of this? Well, deep learning, like I said, has had a significant impact in the area of computational pathology you know, over the last five to uh, six years. Uh, because suddenly there's an appreciation that the amount of data that's latent in these pathology slides, like I said, supersedes anything that we see in other medical domains, at least medical imaging domains, right? So if you look at, you know, MRI scans, CAT scans, you know, we typically tend to talk about hundreds of megabytes of data for a single scan with a single biopsy core or prostate biopsy core, a single biopsy, you're talking about several gigabytes of data. And to put that further in perspective, for a typical prostate biopsy, you typically get about 12 samples, 12 cores. So then you're talking about something like 20 to 30 gigabytes of data that's being generated per patient. And that's only when you talk about the biopsy cores. If you're actually doing a physical surgical resection of the prostate itself, you're gonna talk about you know, much higher orders of magnitude of data that's gonna be generated. So this has really been a boon for machine learning researchers because suddenly there's an appreciation that, wow, there's so much data that we can then leverage to train neural networks. And this is just a very simple neural network that we published on about six years ago to uh, just a, a very initial stack sparse autoencoder where we provided annotations of the individual cells to the stack sparse autoencoder. The autoencoder learned based on the annotations of the cells uh, what the patterns for the cells were, and then outputted essentially the spatial location of those cells, and you know it worked well and um, it gave us. Now, um, can I can I ask you a couple sure. of details here? Yeah. So, uh, we've we've looked at convolutional neural networks, which are basically learning these filters at yeah. multiple levels, yeah. which are then applied through the image. In this particular case, where does the feature learning come in? Did you sort of hand engineer? some of these features or did you learn the shape of cells automatically? Yeah, so what we're doing here is that we're providing annotations where the annotations are located around the individual cells. So literally there is uh, a patch that is provided to the, uh, the network and within the patch, the cell is contained. So really what the network tries to learn are things like you know, the gradients, it tries to learn the shape of the cells, it's sort of roughly elliptical. It also tries to learn the interface between the inside of the cell and the outside cytoplasm, right? So that gradient, so it picks up those gradient uh, representations. Uh, and so then, you know, when you apply it to the image, it basically goes and looks for things that are elliptical and where you see a transition going from the inner, a more darkly stained, internal portion of the cell versus the lighter stained cytoplasm that's immediately outside. Now, did the concept of an elliptical thing to look for arise from the learning or is that something that you hand code <laughs> into the machine? Yeah. So this was completely uh, uh, sort of unsupervised feature learning. We didn't encode any attributes to the network per se. We just provided it with the, with the patches uh, with the cells contained within them. Within them. And now, where did those patches come from? Did the, I mean, did you? Manual yeah, manual annotation. So it was basically, we, um, we broke up the entire uh, image into a series of um, uh, different cells. Like this work, and just to contextualize, this work was published about six years ago. Yeah. Um, so we literally had students, uh, a lot of high school students sat and literally created little boxes, bounding boxes around these individual cells. Um, broke the image up into a series of these bounding boxes and then provided that to the, the network. Okay, so then the network basically learns to recognize boxes that have cells and boxes that don't have cells. That's right, that's okay. right. And that's for example, right. if I sort of draw some, uh, you know, boxes in your image here, yeah. in red, there are some that are not annotated. Is this because there was no student to provide that one? Uh, or yeah, that's yeah, so, this, so that's a great question. So why are some of these getting missed? So some of these getting missed for a few different reasons. One is uh, differential staining. Um, the fact that some of these things get stained more darkly, some of these are more lightly stained. So you know, that, uh, that causes an issue. The other issue is that there are actually different types of cells in here. You've got 
Uh, lymphocytes that tend to be much smaller, you've got cancer nuclei that tend to be larger. When we did this work about six years ago, we didn't really appreciate the nuanced differences between different cell types. So when you see some of these cells getting missed out, it's also because it wasn't a more homogeneous set of annotations being provided to the network. So in other words, we didn't control for the small cells versus the large cells. And so because there was some of that discrepancy, uh, you, you, know, you, you tend to, um, the network wasn't trained in the, in the best, most robust way. The other issue is that staining, uh, what we've recognized, and there's been a lot of work in the space now, that staining of these slides can cause a lot of impact on the networks themselves. So uh, differential staining, coarse staining, can actually have a significant impact on the fidelity of these uh, of segmentations. And so there's been a lot of work now to do color augmentation as a pre-processing step to running these networks. So you do some sort of calibration or color normalization to the slides before running the network. None of this was done in this particular work from six years ago. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Great question. Uh, so subsequently what we did, and this is I think the, the sort of classic slide I, I would hold up um, to just be wary of trusting these, um, these neural network algorithms or deep learning algorithms blindly. So this was a, um, the, the sort of next step of uh, our journey with deep learning in, in digital pathology. So the first work was let's use it to go in and find uh, individual structures, segmentation of individual cells. The next question was, could we now train the algorithm, again, with unsupervised feature generation to really ask the question, um, could we predict at a higher level what the patient level diagnosis was? So in other words, could we now try to figure out um, who is at risk for heart failure versus not at risk for heart failure? So what we did here was essentially provided a series of patches from endomyocardial biopsies. So these were patients um, who had biopsies of the heart and they were all undergoing uh, transplants, heart transplants. So one of the questions you ask in uh, these patients is you look at the biopsies, pathologists look at the biopsies and they try to figure out whether there is uh, any failure evident on these hearts. Um, and if there is evidence of failure, then these are probably not good um, hearts for transplant, right? Uh, so this is uh, uh, an important question. And what we wanted to see was, could we train a network uh, in this case, a CNN, based off these endomyocardial biopsies to really distinguish between what was a normal heart versus a training, uh, versus a failing heart. So again, there was no, um, uh, we took two different approaches. One was a, um, a, a CNN based approach where we essentially went in and mined a different uh, set of ROIs uh, from within a broadly uh, marked up region of interest, right? So we essentially had the pathologist sort of mark out very, in a very um, approximate gross way where the, the region of interest was. Within that, we went and randomly sampled a different, a number of different regions of interest. Uh, all were, I think, about 1024 by 1024 patches. That was then um, provided to the network to learn, again, with unsupervised feature generation. And we, the idea here was that we wanted to try to understand uh, whether the network would distinguish between patients uh, who were normal versus those that were at risk for heart failure. We had about 105 patients that we used for training, 104 patients for training, and then we had another 100 and something patients that we used for independent testing. Now, all these patients came from the same site. So these are all patients from the University of Pennsylvania. And just to make it interesting, what we also did was we had two cardiac pathologists look at the same validation set. And so we asked them the same question, could you distinguish which ones were the failing hearts versus which ones were the normal hearts? Now, we already knew which ones were normal versus failing because we had had a, a, a set of pathologists uh, do consensus grading of all of these cases. So that was determined to be the ground truth based on uh, consensus of multiple different pathologists. And so we had two separate pathologists who looked at the test set of these uh, 100 odd patients. And when we applied it, uh, the network to those uh, 100, 104 cases or so in the test set, uh, you can see here the results, the AUC was 0.97. So the, you know, the area on the curve for the CNN was amazing. Uh, if you looked at the pathologist, the area on the curve was only about 74%, right? So this was 
this was uh, quite baffling, but obviously we got very excited. Uh, so, you know, we put out a press release about the paper and, you know, it got a lot of traction and that was briefly trending on Reddit for a while. Uh, but a few months later, a couple of months later, what we did was we got another set of patients from Penn, from the same institution, uh, scanned on the same scanner. We ran the same algorithm again, the same CNN again on these patients and found that when we ran the CNN on this new set of patients, that the AUC actually dropped from 0.97 down to 0.75, right? And so this is really baffling. So we had no idea what was going on. And um, after at least about a couple of months of head scratching and, and trying to really figure out what had happened, what we realized was that that second tranche of images that had come had been scanned on the same scanner, but in the interim, there had been a software upgrade that had been applied to the scanner. So essentially, a small software upgrade to the scanner had very, very imperceptibly, very subtly changed the attributes of the image. And because of that, the image features um, and the corresponding representations in the CNN had changed. From a pathologist standpoint, they weren't any different, but the distributions of these images had changed so imperceptibly because of this remote software upgrade that the neural network now went from 0.97 down to 0.75. Right? And so this was really a, a very, very startling lesson to us that you, know, you really have to be very careful in blindly trusting these algorithms because this was not, this was so unexpected on so many levels, right? So I'm sure a lot of you have read about how you know, a lot of these CNNs and neural networks, when you go from one side to another side, they don't generalize. But this was an example where on this data from the same site, from the same lab, from the same scanner, that the network had now gone from, you know, ninety-seven percent accuracy or area under the oh, table. Anand, one of the one of the advantages of these hand-engineered features is that they are more or less, you know, resilient. yeah, more resilient to this type of uh, artifact. Right. Yeah. And my question is. If you, I mean, you're showing an example in panel F. So yeah. if you go back and ask what types of features am I finding, yeah. how many look like F and how many are actually the kinds of stuff that you would have hand, hand engineered? And are there ways of yeah. sort of filtering out features explicitly yeah. that appear yeah. to be not capturing the type of local information that- uh, yeah. you know, ex, ex, Excellent question. So. The panel in F actually shows an example of some of the representations we learned, but we hadn't explicitly modeled for. This is exactly the lesson that we learned. What we learned was when you do the unsupervised feature generation, a lot, of, particularly with the CNN, a lot of what you're learning are these convolutions, right? So you're learning a lot of convolutions of the original image, and that's it, soliciting a lot of these textual responses. The problem with these textual responses with these convolutions is that they tend to be sensitive to you know, staining variations and pre-analytic sources of variation. But there are some important lessons like in panel F when you realize that the signal seems to be emanating from around the vicinity of you know, some types, particular types of cells, in this case, myocytes, right? So even though we had not explicitly encoded for myocytes, that's a very valuable lesson because it's saying that, you know, it's not exactly the myocyte architecture that the network is learning, but the signal is coming around from the vicinity of the myocytes. And so this work actually engendered subsequent approach, which actually is in press right now. I'll be happy to share it with the group when the paper comes out formally, where we actually looked at the spatial arrangement of the myocytes uh, and looked at this in a much, much larger cohort, 2,300 patients, five different sites, and generated a, a, an area on the curve, which is very comparable to this uh, 0.97, something in that 0 0.95, 0 0.96 range, but one that was truly resilient because it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't sensitive to the variations across sites and across scanners. So even though this didn't quite pan out the way we expected it to, you're absolutely right that it laid the groundwork for us to go in and say, okay, well, it's the, the, the network seems to focus its attention in certain part of the image. And that seems to be where the action is. And that's sort of what we uh, ended up modeling explicitly and subsequently. Yeah, okay. 
So um, I just want to sort of just share a couple of examples here. I mean, this is a um, you know, quote from uh, Professor Jordan at UC Berkeley, yeah, very, very well respected in the machine learning space. You know, he's, he's come out, he, he made this comment about trusting these brute force algorithms too much is a fate misplaced. And I don't know, Manolis, whether you've had Cynthia Rudin from Duke, um, you know, participate, um, you know, in this seminar series, she might be another person to um, to bring in because you know Cynthia put, in, put out a very highly influential paper a couple of years ago in Nature Machine Intelligence. Uh, she previously presented at NIPS, but she says that you know trusting these brute force algorithms, um, you know, too much. I mean, this is you, know, you you absolutely got to stop trusting the black box for high stakes decisions, right? And that's really happens in the context of you know uh, problems in medical imaging and, and clinical diagnosis. Um, and this is another great example I'd love to share from Samir Singh's work at UC Irvine. You know, this is a classic example where you, you need to be aware of what the network is learning. Uh, you know, he did this problem, he did this um, you know, particular um, uh, problem with his student where they try to train a network to distinguish huskies from wolves and found that when they trained the network using images downloaded from the internet, they got like a 98, 99% accuracy in distinguishing huskies from wolves. But Samir, who clearly is way smarter than I am, because when he saw those results, he realized immediately, uh, you know, this is too good to be true. Unlike, you know, yours truly, who got really excited and went and put out a press release, um, uh, you know, realized that this just doesn't make sense because these animals look so similar to each other. What they found was that the network didn't actually learn any of the features of the face of the animal. It just, it just learned the fact that there was snow in the background for all those images with huskies in it. Right, classic case in point where you know you just have to really think about what is the network learning, right, and and really focus on that. And that you know, sure, it makes sense here, and that's great. But it also tells you about where you can trip up the network, right? If that's really what it's learning, just learning the fact that there's snow in the background, right? But I think the point that you know I'm trying to get at here is that there is, I mean, this is not something that you want to you know throw out. I don't want to be overtly critical. I think there's huge opportunities. And I think the, the place where we found that the deep learning really can play a role uh, is in its utility with segmentation. In detection and segmentation, that's sort of where we found there's a real utility with these approaches. Uh, it's a paper we put out about five years ago where we showed the utility of deep learning, uh, expanding on our earlier work where we showed it for finding different types of cells, different types of uh, tissue types, uh, you know, cubules, mitotic figures, you know, series of different uh, types of uh, constructs on these images. Um, and you know, now these, these things are becoming pretty uh, routine. You can run these of, you know, off the shelf hardware. Um, you know, you can, with, with uh, GPUs, um, you know, you can generate almost real time results with deep learning to do image segmentation, even on very large pathology images. The image that you're seeing here is about a 40,000 pixel by 40,000 pixel image. And you're capturing with a pretty routine network, you know, hundreds of thousands of nuclei and lymphocytes on these large images very, very quickly. Now, the challenge though has been and continues to be annotation, right? These are these networks still require a lot of data to train and to learn. And even though there's been a lot of work on semi-supervised learning and, and one-shot learning, the fact is that. You know, to train up these networks from a segmentation perspective, it takes effort, and the effort means that you've got to sit in and manually annotate and mark up these images. So what we've put out, uh, you can look this up, this is on GitHub, uh, and there's a paper on, on archives that you should be able to download as well called Quick Annotator. And so what it is, is basically, it's an interactive tool which allows you to go in, segment out a few representative exemplars, uh, once that's done, uh, it trains a network in the background and generates an initial output. And using that output, the end user can actually mark up and, and fine tune the results. So just like Malolis identified on one of the previous slides that there were a few cells that were missing. Now what you can do is you can work off the output of the network, go in and mark up cells that were missed out. Maybe things that were over segmented, you can, you can edit that. Having done that, you now pass this back to the network. And so in an interactive active learning mode, the network learns very quickly and can start to very quickly hone in uh, and converge on a desired result. So you can very quickly interactively stand up 
pretty good networks, pretty quickly. It's very impressive. And I think it's, a, it's, it's very much a new paradigm in the sense that the human can be part of the loop, but with massive you know, machine learning power in the background, which is very nice. Because the big, bot the big uh, bottleneck, the big stumbling block for this is, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, the lack of butt time, right? That's what it comes down to. There's a lack of butt time, particularly for pathologists who are so busy. They just simply don't have the time to sit down and annotate, right? So this is, uh, this is a classic example of, you know, mother being the nest, you know, um, you know the, the necessity being the mother we mentioned here, right? So you've got to come up with ways to, to help improve the efficiency of the annotation process. So, uh, so I want to just sort of talk a little bit in the little time I have about some of the opportunities with handcrafted features. So, like I said, you know, I gave the example, you know, I gave the example with the the um, graph-based motifs for different types of cells. So, what we've done now is basically use deep learning to identify different tissue compartments, different types of cells. Once we do that, we're able to invoke graph networks, things like uh, you know, Voronoi tessellations, Delaunay triangulations. Uh, create these different uh, graph motifs and then look at spatial statistics that look at the interplay and the arrangement of different cell types within different tissue compartments. So you can define different cell types, stromal cells, uh, tumor and free lymphocytes. You can look at different tissue compartments, epithelium, stroma, and you can start to look at the interplay. Now, the advantage here is more interpretable features because you know what you're extracting. You know that uh, you're talking about really this the spatial architecture and spatial arrangement of stromal cells and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And so that sort of is where we found the most bang for the buck because uh, using the machine learning to do the segmentation, uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, another very important hallmark of pathology images, which is the collagen, right? So the collagen is sort of the bedrock, it's the framework of these pathology images, it's the, the fibrous tissue that runs through these pathology images. And, and what we've done is used deep learning, but use it to segment out the tumor nests and then segment out the collagen fibers. Once we've done that, we're able to look at the orientation of the collagen fiber. So we're assigning a vector to the collagen fiber. Once we do that, we then borrow the concept of entropy to look at the disorder of those, ve of those vectors. So essentially, if you find that the, the fibers are all in the same direction, then the uh, entropy is low, right? If the fibers are discordant with respect to each other, the vectors are discordant with respect to each other, the entropy is high, right? So essentially, we were able to convert deep machine learning, deep learning to apply to segmentation of the collagen fibers, but then converted it into this entropy of the orientation of collagen fibers, and then demonstrated that this entropy was actually very prognostic of survival in breast cancer patients. So we were actually able to show these are kaplan meyer curves, um, where you know, it was a good way of showing time to event data. And so essentially demonstrate that this collagen, uh, this, this vector orientation entropy feature uh, very nicely distinguishes breast cancer patients based on their survival. But now we're doing it not based on some opaque feature, we're doing it based on an interpretable feature. Deep learning did the heavy lifting with the segmentation, but beyond that, it's the handcrafted engineered features that we're employing. Um, um, should I maybe do, do we have time for a couple more examples? Yeah, let's let's, let's uh, run just a little bit over. We have some flexibility on the end time, so. Okay, all right. So maybe I'll just give one more example here with some of the work we're doing. Uh, I'll skip over this. I'll give one example here with prostate cancer, which we just put out yesterday. The, the, the paper yeah. came out yesterday, um, and so this is a you know another big problem in prostate cancer that I mentioned before, is that uh, in, in these patients after they have surgery. Um, you know, some of them will have recurrence. And that's a problem because these patients who have recurrence after surgery uh, tend to do poorly. They tend to actually have a high likelihood of dying because of prostate cancer. So one of the questions we wanted to ask was, could we look at the specimens, the surgical specimens, and figure out early whether these patients are going to have recurrence or not? Because if you could figure out whether they're going to have recurrence, they can start to get additional treatments to mitigate the risk of dying because of prostate cancer. So we did a large study with 900 patients. This literally just came out yesterday morning in, in Nature Precision Oncology. You should find it online. And I'm happy to share the paper as well. And so this case, we used deep learning to do the segmentation of glands, but then looked at spatial art arrangement and spatial architecture of the glands um, and, and used uh, 263 patients to train the model uh, based on these, uh, these uh, features and then validated it on about 600 odd patients. 
and found again that it, it did really well. It did a great job in distinguishing between patients who did have recurrence versus those who did not have recurrence. But we went one step further. What we also did in the study was we compared it with a $3,000 molecular assay that is currently being used for predicting outcome for prostate cancer. So this is a commercial test. Um, and this is in the, uh, the NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. It's tissue destructive, it's $3,000, so it's expensive. It's out of the reach of most um, uh, you know, LMICs or, or um, you know, uh, low middle income countries. And so we want to see whether just looking at image features from these pathology images, how that did with this $3,000 assay. And so we went head to head and found that in a head to head comparison, they actually did pretty well Again, in terms of the Kaplan-Meier survival assessment uh, with respect to each other, there was almost sort of an equivalence between the performance of these assays. But what was really interesting was when we combined the image features with two very simple clinical factors, when we looked at PSA, which is a biomarker for prostate cancer, everybody gets the biomarker assessment, the PSA assessment, and the Gleason score, which is a standard and other variable that is looked at in the context of prostate cancer patients, we actually showed that we could almost improve the performance of the image classifier to twice that of the molecular classifier. And all of this was happening based on interpretable features, intuitive features, validated on over 600 patients, and did it in a way that could be done for orders of cost lower, orders of magnitude lower cost. So that molecular assay is $3,000. This is literally like five bucks, right? Because you're just talking about an image of the slide and that's being analyzed using these, these algorithms, and that's it. And so um, just in the interest of time, I'll sort of skip over all the other stuff, but I just really, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, feel free to look at the slides. Uh, I'm happy to sort of come back and, and, and answer questions, uh, but just want to sort of, the rest of the presentation is really about more examples of where these approaches, where the deep learning can really serve as a basis for identifying the, uh, the initial motifs from which we can then go in and extract handcrafted features. And so huge opportunity here. I mean, not just in prognosis and outcome, one of the other opportunities that we've discovered here is that finding with these approaches, you can start to find differences in the disease phenotype between different populations. So this is work we put out last year, where we found differences between African-American men with prostate cancer versus Caucasian-American men with prostate cancer. Again, deep learning was used to just define the tissue compartments, but then we used features of the individual uh, statistics of the cells to, to capture these differences and found that we could create better prognostic models by taking into account population-specific differences. But Anand, be... isn't, isn't this what the sort of fully connected layers of the deep learning network is supposed to do? Basically, I feel that you're, you're basically saying, okay, great, we can learn the features using mm -hmm. the convolutional layers of the network. No, we, no, we're not learning any features. So now what we're doing is we're using the CNN to do the segmentation. Yeah. But beyond the segmentation, all the subsequent feature analysis is being done using handcrafted approaches. So the CNN actually is not used beyond the segmentation. Then it's all organic feature yeah. engineering. So, so basically, so what's your, what's your outlook for where the field is going? Do you feel that we will not be able to learn these handcrafted features using I, a full deep learning approach? I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I, I have some reservations, I think. So I come at it from more of a clinical, I have more of a clinical bias here, clinical perspective, the way I see um, the innovation. For me, the innovation has to be tied to interpretability because clinicians ultimately are going to want to see transparency with these approaches. Um, I think that there is an opportunity to do discovery with deep learning to potentially identify areas to focus on and suggest clues as to what to go after. But I still think that we're just scratching the surface on the feature engineering side. I think there's a lot that still can be done with feature engineering. And literally what I've shown here are just very, very few examples, but like with the collagen fiber orientation and so on. We're just scratching the surface. But you know, a lot of that is based on what we know already about the domain, about the pathobiology of the domain. Uh, I, I, I think we've got a way to go where um, the feature engineering will be directly driven by the deep learning. I think at this point, deep learning can suggest where to look. And, but then beyond that, I think the feature engineering has to come from the data scientists and the computer scientists and the bioengineers.
Um, but you know, I think uh, one of the things that I'm that's what because we are perspective is so important because I think yeah. many people, I mean, at least in our background, come from the machine learning perspective and say, okay, great, we can do everything. But I think having someone who's actually a practitioner come back and say, well, so far it hasn't been that useful for us, I think is extremely important. It's the interpretability. I think it's really the interpretability that's a real driver for a clinician because that, the clinicians I talk to, you know, you've got to think of it from their perspective, right? You, yeah. you tell them, don't use chemotherapy in someone. Am I going to trust a black box where I don't understand the representations yeah, yeah. to decide not to give somebody chemotherapy, right? So that's a we big had a whole dedicated lecture on interpretability. Uh, so my, my big question is, is it just a lack of interpretation because some of that can be addressed or is it that we will never actually be able to learn these features? But I, I guess that's an open challenge to the field and yeah. we'll see how the other things progress. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Well. Great. Anand, any other parting words? Uh, we no, I, I just uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to stir the pot a little bit. Um, you know, sorry, I um, I think this took uh, a little longer than I'd anticipated. I'd probably put in too many slides, but um, I think um, yeah, it's, it's it's still so much to be done. I think there's a huge opportunity also on convergence of your handcrafted and deep learning features, and I think that you know I, I would just throw out there that we want to constantly keep pushing ourselves to question what the network is like. I mean, that would be my parting thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think we want to take anything for granted. Exactly. And, and, and part of the reason I want to show one of our failures was exactly to drive home that point, that yeah. don't trust what the network is learning blindly. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I no, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. I want to uh, ask everyone to join me in really thanking him for an outstanding and very, very illuminating talk. So thank, thank you. you. Okay, right. thank you all, take care. Thank you. Our next guest today is uh, Bree Aldridge, who's uh, gonna be telling us about her own work on using machine learning for image segmentation in a very different type of application. So Bree, take it away. All right, are you guys seeing my desktop? Yes, we are. PowerPoint? All right, let me share my slide. There and then you you're go. seeing the full slides now, right? All right, yep. All right, perfect. You would think a year into this, I would be better at presenting PowerPoint on Zoom. All right, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm first going to say that I'm gonna tell you about some of the work my lab has, has been doing on the more translational side to try and design combination therapies for TB. Um, we use a lot of machine learning approaches um, and I will tell you, because this is a deep learning class, the areas where we tried deep learning and failed. And so I think this might be um, an opportunity to sort of consider um, when to use deep learning and when to not use deep learning. And then I'll, I'll offer some ideas as I move along about areas in which I, I think we may be able to move into deep learning as we get more high quality data to work with. So Great. this is fantastic. And it actually follows very nicely the theme that Anand set out in his own talk. So <laughs> that's why I think it's so important to bring in the practitioners, uh, especially when we come from the deep learning part. So I, I love that. So take it away. Take it away. Yeah, I mean, so I come from the perspective that we should always try what's simplest first. Yeah. So when, when we come with a, a data-driven question, you start with the simplest methodology first. So you're going to see that um, act out in our slides. And in all of these cases, we did try CNNs, and yeah. they did much worse wow. than just even sometimes an unsupervised approach. And so you know, I'd be interested in everyone's feedback about why that might be true when you kind of get a look at what kind of a mess our data sets look like, but these are real data sets in the case of, of TV research. So it's the reality that we're in. Great. Okay. So um, my lab is really motivated by the stunning difficulty in treating TV. So TV is a bacterial pathogen and it is the, except this year, it's the leading cause of death in the world due to a single infectious agent. And TB requires treatment with multiple antibiotics for usually six months. So we are working together as a field, both in academia, nonprofits, and in pharmaceutical companies to design new universal shorter treatment courses of multidrug therapies for TB. And a major bottleneck for us is how do you actually design a multidrug therapy for TB? Um, and how do you do this efficiently? Because the combination space is really huge. The reason why, and I'm going to mention this here because this idea of heterogeneity is going to come up a lot in my talk, 
The major driver for the reason why we need to, to treat with multiple drugs for TB is heterogeneity. Usually people talk about how you need to treat with multiple drugs to slow the acquisition of drug resistance. But we see in the case of TB, a lot of innate cell to cell heterogeneity. And, and this is what a lot of my lab focuses on, but I'm not gonna talk much about today. The reason for multiple drugs actually is also because um, when TB is resident in the lung, it's in what we call these granuloma environments in the lung. And each granuloma I think of as being a cave. And um, in each of those caves of granulomas, the bacteria, the resident bacteria are exposed to different microenvironments that change the drug response. So when you're treating a patient for TB, you're treating multiple populations of TB, which is why you need different drugs so that you always have susceptibility. Okay, so how does this normally work? We talk about the path of MIC to mice to man. So this is a typical process for drug development and also for development of multidrug therapies. And so the way this works in TB is um, most of the, the drug um, study work that does that happens in the lab for MIC, so this would be broth-based medium, is done for single drugs. And then those best drugs progress in single drugs and in limited ad hoc combinations in mice models, and then moves to clinical trials. And so what we're missing is this huge unexplored combination space, right? So what I'd like you to consider is what the size of that space is. So if we've got about 20 current drugs that work against TB and we need a combination of three, we need a minimum of three drugs to treat TB. Um, 20 choose three is 1140 combinations, right? And there's definitely no way of testing that. And we, we need to understand I, I always liken drug combinations to cooking or recipes. So the example I've been using today is salads. Like here we're measuring the single drugs as individual salad components. But when you eat out at fancy restaurants and they give you these like expensive salads, like sometimes those flavor profiles are unexpectedly good, right? So like we're into spring. And so if you have like a mescaline salad with strawberries and then goat cheese, you would never think of adding those things together, but actually that's a really nice salad. So that would be a synergistic combination that we would find in this unexplored combination space if we tried to sample this a little bit better. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And there has been a lot of recent clinical trials that have, um, have been turning up results just in the past two years that show that even without using new drugs, there are many new combinations, novel combinations that are found to be more effective than the current standard of care, which again is six months long. So it's an incredibly long time to be on antibiotic treatment. All right, so back to this pipeline, um, you may have heard that um, we're really failing to produce new antibiotics um, to, treat and, um, to treat bacterial pathogens, but I would argue that that's not true for TB. TB, the TB field has produced a lot of new antibacterials, and the issue we're having is now our combination space is too large to actually measure. So what I'm gonna tell you about today are two different projects that we have in the lab to try and see if we can really utilize the practical um, experimental space that we can have up here in the MIC realm to progress and really prioritize the very best combinations or salads that we can find of our available ingredients to move on so that we make sure we're capturing the best combinations to be progressed into animal models and then to be moved into clinical trials. So um, in the first part of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about how do we actually narrow in on the single drug space by rapidly using imaging to identify pathway of action of new drugs. And the second um, part of my talk, I'm gonna go over ways that we make systematic combination measurements in vitro and use machine learning to develop classifiers to predict which novel combinations are more likely to be an improvement over the standard of care. Okay. So my lab does a lot of time-lapse imaging and work that I'm not gonna talk about today, but here what I'm showing you is some old movies we have of M. smegmas, which is a soil relative of TB, um, with a chromosome label in bright green. And um, in these movies we have treated, let me see if I can, um, oops, wrong way, play these again. When the drugs go on, rifampicin is on the left, moxie is on the right. These have two very different mechanisms of action. And when the drug goes on, you see that the cell morphologies change. I see you guys have had some lectures on cell morphology. So here we're looking at things like cell shape, 
chromosome localization, um, the compactness or elongation of the chromosome. And you can see that the, the treatment outcome was rifampicin and moxifloxacin look totally different from each other. So the question is whether or not we could use morphological profiling using this idea that Joe Pogliano's lab first published in 2013. Here's an, an example with E. coli, where what they did is they took E. coli, they um, treated the bacteria with different drugs, they fixed them, they did staining and high throughput imaging, and then they used basically unsupervised learning and, and clustering to associate like profiles and the hypothesis that they tested and found to be true is that when profiles look the same, those drugs have a similar mechanism of action. So this is a guilt by association idea, but the idea is if we have a large enough reference set of TB drugs and we have a new TB drug, can we take it, make a morphological profile, figure out which reference drugs it matches the best so that we can have an idea of what secondary assays to do to understand whether or not those, um, what the, that drug is actually doing. Okay, so here's the idea. Here's the m smegmos images you saw before. I added in another drug here. Um, you could see very clearly in E. coli this works, in smegmotis this works. We didn't know if it was gonna work on TB. All right, so here's what we see. So these images look like a hot mess, right? What you see, this is fixed cell imaging of TB. So we took TB, which is a BSL-3 level organism. We treated them with drugs. We fixed them. We brought them out of the lab, the BL-3 lab into the BL-2. We um, stained them and did imaging. And what I want you to see about these images down here, there's a chromosome label in green and a lipophilic cell membrane dye in red. And then this is phase contrast imaging on top. <clears throat> and you can see, first of all, that Many of the bacteria, unlike what you saw with E. coli, many of the bacteria didn't take up stain at all, right? These are cell permeable dyes, are supposed to be cell permeable. So we have a lot of dark cells and the features, the morphological features don't look very distinctly different from each other, okay? So we thought actually, we thought this project was gonna stop a bunch of times because this looks just way too difficult. The, the features are not as um, obvious as they are in M. smegmatis. Um, but um, members of my lab, so um, Trevor Smith and Krista Pullen, who is a former member of the lab, stuck with it, and they went ahead and quantified these features in a smaller reference set of drug treatments and just looked at, at things like the cell length, cell width, the amount of staining over, this is over about 10,000 cells per treatment group, um, looked at the compaction of the nucleoid and looked at the degree of staining. And we saw that there was a lot of treatment groups that had statistically significant differences from untreated. And so we went through and tried to see if this would work anyways. Okay, so this is the typical pipeline that's established for cytological profiling. I'll just indicate that the same pathway works for eukaryotic cells as well. And so we expected it to work for TB. The idea is you treat bacteria or cells, you fix them, you stain them, you do high throughput imaging, you do automatic image analysis and feature extraction. And so in some cases you can use deep learning to do this as well. We didn't need to use deep learning in this instance. And then we just wanna do a classification trial to try and associate or figure out which treatment groups look most similar to each other. Okay, this is what we saw. So this is from um, Joe Pogliano's paper in E. coli and you see the different replicates for the different treatment groups. And on a, just a general PCA space, so unsupervised learning, you see that the treatment groups clump with each other. This is what we see with M tuberculosis on the side. So we're just showing two PCs here because the um, amount of variation isn't too huge. They're color coded roughly by the general class of action of the drugs. And you can see that these are all mixed up. You can't, the replicates aren't even next to each other, right? So this is not going to work at all in the same way it's gonna work for E. coli. And maybe that's not surprising after seeing what our images look like. What is happening uh, here? Is it that the pathogens are responding to the drugs that they're sort of very diverse in their mechanism of response or something? Is that what makes them most virulent? Um, well, some of that is that um, the cell wall is extremely thick. The cell wall is about 30 times thicker in TB than it is in E. coli. And so it's really hard for the drugs to get in. 
Got it's it. A, Basically, it's, what you're seeing is that there's no difference between different types of treatments because the cells are just impervious to treatment. Well, that's not true. It turns out that there are differences. So just give me a moment. I'm going to get there. Okay. We're going to make it work. Just not, um, we have to jump through a couple more hoops first to make it work. Okay. Um, so at this point, I think we did try deep learning and that didn't work. So this is when we tried a neural net to see if that would work. It didn't. Um, I think that the data is just too variable. So we, um, we knew we had some trouble, like myco, the mycobacterial field knows that there's a ton of batch to batch heterogeneity. So we thought we needed to address the batch to batch heterogeneity of our experiments. We know that there's a ton of cell to cell heterogeneity that should have been obvious to you in looking at the images. We also saw that there were subtle features and, and maybe we needed nonlinear clustering to do um, likeness of the profiles. And so in an attempt to fix this, the first thing we did was to handle the batch normalization using an approach called typical variation normalization that was developed by our collaborator, Mike Ando at Google. And the idea with TVN is to align the covariance matrices produced by the PCA of the untreated controls from each experiment. So you basically um, normalize the mean to zero and the variance to one. And then you apply that transformation to every single batch from the untreated to the treated groups. So what we're doing is basically taking the fact that these are not aligned, these two different batches, we apply TVN. And then when we apply it, we see these untreated groups are now intermixed with each other. So what we're trying to do is reduce some of the non-bio, like the, the batch variation that is not biologically important. Um, and in order to do this, one thing I'll point out is we need a significant number of untreated controls in our imaging. So in our imaging pipeline, we dedicate a full 25% of our imaging time to untreated samples. There's no way to make this work without significant untreated controls in every single biological and technical replicate that we do. Okay. Um, so the other thing we did is we explicitly incorporated cell to cell heterogeneity metrics including things like inner quartile range um, and the lower and upper quartiles for our the features that we end up using. So we went from around 25 features to 100 features. And when we do this and apply the batch um, normalization approaches, which I just introduced you to TVN, we see that our PCA space does improve. So the cell wall acting agents are now near each other. Um, but the others are kind of intermixed. So we do see some clustering, but not enough, I think, to do any sort of reliable classification. I wouldn't really rely on any of that, but I think we're getting closer. Wow. So the next thing we did was to try and sort of tackle these other parts of the feature, um, the subtle features that we were seeing, and maybe we, we thought that PCA was just too linear and we needed some nonlinear clustering algorithms instead. Um, so this is the expanded pipeline that we use for what we call our approach is called Morpheus or morphological evaluation and understanding of stress specific for TB, but we think it'll work for other organisms as well. The feature quantification, I, I don't think we need to go into here. It's any sort of image segmentation you want. We filter out out of focus cells and we create our feature list, which includes explicit um, features of cell to cell heterogeneity in each image. And then to capture the subtle morphological changes, we shifted from using PCA to a K nearest neighbor approach to link the similar profiles. So we use a stochastic approach to do this in what we call classification trials. And the reason why we needed to do this is we found that the untreated controls we chose for the TVN, the batch normalization, it was extremely fragile. So we could come up with many good solutions of our, KN, our CK and our KNNs. Um, and it depended on um, what uh, untreated controls we used. And so to kind of get around that fragility, um, we took the stochastic approach. So the way we do it with each classification trial is to do choose a new set of um, untreated, controls. We do feature ordering using um, MR, MR. Have you guys gone through that approach yet? Minimum redundancy, maximum relevance? Uh, no. Okay. So it's, 
It's a, it's a feature selection um, algorithm that's commonly used for um, looking at changes in gene expression. And here, um, the idea is uh, to make sure we're looking for things that are not co-varying much with each other, um, but that are, are tightly correlated then with differences in outcomes. So that's the, the we call it the Mr. Mr. in our lab. So we use that to uh, rank order our features, and then we do our batch normalization. We do a KNN um, of our PCA space, and then we evaluate the success in each trial. And the success is judged based on how well each of the known drugs are found to be profiled with another drug in the same general class. We do backward selection to reduce our feature set progressively. And then we use that to identify the optimal set of features within each of these stochastic trials. Usually on average, we have about 35 to 40 features that we end up with in an optimal run. Um, we run this 70 times and we tabulate a consensus of those 70 trials and that's what we call a consensus classification or a CKNN. And so the CKNN data is what I'm going to show you next. All right. So here's our expanded version showing the experiments as well. The other thing I didn't get into here in the interest of time is that we don't only treat with a high dose of treatment, we need to treat with a low dose of drug and a high dose of drug and we make a joint morphological profile. So it's like a mini dose response curve and that's really important for us to figure out what the drugs are doing. We fix and stain the bacteria, we image, we extract our features, we do all the batch normalization, we do stochastic simulation in these trials and get the neighborhood clustering. And that accounts for the different types of heterogeneity we have explicitly um, and the subtle features. Okay, and it works. So what I'm showing you on the right is a heat map that shows the connection strength. So this is the from the consensus um, KNN. So in the yellow are, are how each of these individual 34 drugs how much it connected to each of these broad categories of actions. So that would be like cell wall inhibitors, DNA synthesis inhibitors, respiratory inhibitors, et cetera. And you can see that the cell wall acting agents generally look like cell wall agents. Um, the controls look like controls. The DNA synthesis inhibitors generally look like DNA synthesis inhibitors, et cetera. When we do a cross validation, we find this is about 75% accurate. So we were pretty happy with this actually, given how messy the data themselves looked. Um, we can look at this um, net as a network diagram instead. So here what you're seeing are the tightest links between um, drug to drug connections and the thickness of the line indicates the strength of the connection. And each of the treatment groups is color coded with its broad category of action according to the literature consensus. So what we can see is, you know, even within the immunoglycosides, for example, that they form their own little um, branch over here and they look like each other. And other drugs that target the same pathway like the mycolic acid synthesis inhibitors look very similar to each other. So this all made sense. And um, a piece that didn't make sense was bedaquiline. So I know this isn't a, a, a drug class. Um, so I'll explain. So bedaquiline is a respiratory inhibitor and you can see here it's being misclassified to the cell wall acting agents. And you can see that over here, bedaquiline should be in here. It should light up right in here with the other respiratory inhibitors, but instead it looks like a couple of these cell wall acting agents and that confused us. So there was two simple solutions to this. One, we were wrong, or two, bedaquiline is doing something that we hadn't figured out before. Um, that we were seeing with morphological profiling that wasn't picked up by standard you know, transcriptional analysis. Um, this spadaculin is an ATP synthesis inhibitor. It shuts down the ability of TB um, to carry out oxidative phosphorylation. And so our hypothesis was that it was inducing some sort of um, energy crisis that um, because glycolysis feeds directly into synthesis of the cell wall, we thought that would look like a catastrophic failure of the cell membrane and the cell wall. And so that's why it would look like a cell wall death as a proximal cause of death instead of the respiratory chain inhibition, which was the, the root cause of um, biological activity here. 
Um, if this is true, then we wouldn't see the same catastrophic change in the cell wall if we took the bacteria out of glycolysis. And one way to do that would be to grow them up instead of in sugar water in rich growth conditions to put them on fatty acids for growth. So we did that. We had to rely back on our old PCA space because we didn't have enough of a treatment group here. Um, but what you see here are the cell wall acting agents in, in glycolysis, so in rich growth conditions. And you can see bedaquiline is here in the blue dots and it, it links similarly to the cell wall acting agents or at least roughly. But when we grow them on fatty acids instead, um, the bedaquiline group looks like everybody else. But the important thing there is that means it does not look like a cell wall acting agent anymore. And then we've seen this replicated um, in subsequent experiments. So these data support the observation that the mechanism of action of bedaquiline is dependent on the metabolic state of TB and that um, the proximal cause of death in rich growth conditions is cell wall failure rather than the respiratory um, inhibition directly. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, and I know this is not necessarily a class that's interested in drug mechanism of action, we went on to go and, and use Morpheus to understand polypharmacologies and other secondary and off-target effects um, for antibacterials for treatment in TB. Um, and we think that this method is particularly good at determining proximal damages rather than the root and molecular targets. And in this way, morphological profiling for TB is a great complement to traditional molecular profiling techniques to really in help us interpret those data. Because one thing that happens when you use a typical omics approach to learn what a drug does in TB is all the pathways get turned on. So it's hard for us as biologists to figure out, well, what should we actually do with that information? This provides us with a very targeted, I, I always describe it as like a flashlight to help direct us towards what part of the, the pathway space we should be doing our secondary studies on. Um, and the other way that we're using morphological profiling now is to look at a whole chemical series. So when they do medicinal chemistry to optimize these new drugs, one thing we need to understand is whether those changes actually change off-target effects and, and in a condition-specific manner. Okay, um, so what we've done so far is use machine learning approach to um, try and rapidly determine using imaging. And you saw that the imaging, we really had to accommodate heterogeneity for kind of the ugliness of what our images look like, batch to batch and cell to cell heterogeneity. And in doing that, and then relying on stochastic trials to handle our feature selection instead of deep learning, we were able to come up with a, a system that, um, and we've done this several times now in subsequent um, experiments that really robustly identifies the mechanism, uh, the, the pathway of action of TB drugs. Um, so before I move on to the second part of the talk, I wondered if I should pause for questions here. I don't think you have to. Keep going. Okay. All right. So then um, the next thing we wanted to do was to try and see if we could tackle this unexplored combination space efficiently using um, in practical in vitro measurements. And um, the way this is typically done is people measure combinations using what's called a checkerboard assay. Is that something that's familiar to people here? I see some nods and some no's. No, okay. So um, the way a checkerboard works is you just essentially measure all drug dose combinations. So if this is a pairwise combination, you have drug X and drug Y, you have increasing doses on on each axis, and then the checkerboard is the combination from both axes. So you're measuring all drug dose combinations of the combination space, and you would choose a phenotype you care about. So in the case of bacterial growth, you might look at the inhibitory concentration of 90% growth inhibition. We call that the IC90, and that might be you know, this gray blob here. And you would follow the contour over the checkerboard and you would look at the shape of the contour to determine whether the drugs were synergistic, meaning they were more effective in combination together than expected, or antagonistic, meaning they were less effective in combination than expected. So um, if they are additive, so they have no interaction, you're going to get a straight line here. If it's synergistic, you're going to get a concave 
contour. And if it's antagonistic, you're gonna get a convex contour. This is very traditionally done. It's easy to do, especially with a, um, with a multi-channel pipette. People do serial dilutions and do this all the time in laboratories. Um, the problem is that the checkerboard assay is actually super inefficient. And it's really inefficient for high order combinations. So TB must be treated with three to four drugs. So if we were to make combination measurements systematically in TB, we run into a very practical problem, which is that a two-way checkerboard requires one microtiter plate. A three-way combination requires three 384 well plates. A four-way combination requires 25 384 well plates for just a single replicate, right? That's really not practical. It definitely cannot be done in a BL3. Um, and so how do people handle this? They just don't measure the high order combinations. They just limit themselves to the pairwise measurements usually, and it's not even done systematically. So um, we developed a hack to the checkerboard assay that um, is a geometric optimization of the checkerboard assay that we call diamond or diagonal measurement of n-way drug interactions. The way it works is we measure the most information rich parts of the checkerboard. We preserve the unit of a dose response curve. So we get we measure the single dose response curves on the axes and we measure the diagonal, which is a one-to-one -one mixture of drug X and drug Y. And this is a quantitative approximation of the shape of the contour. The way it works is if this is my IC50, sorry, my IC90 here in the white circle, um, for drug X and the other one for drug Y here, what we can do is simply project a line to see where it intersects with my diagonal, which is my combination dose response curve. If these two drugs are additive, then you would expect their IC90 to be right where that intersection point is. In this case, it's synergistic, so the actual IC90 is closer to the origin. And if it's farther from this point, then it's antagonistic. And we can quantify this with what we call the fractional inhibitory concentration by just taking this ratio. So it's a quantitative approximation. All right, this also works in high order. We in other labs have done this up to 10 way drug combinations now. Um, and all you do is just do a N way diagonal and project it against a hyperplane to look to see what is that plane of expected additivity. So it really becomes much more efficient in high order combinations. So our idea was to leverage the efficacy of diamond for measuring combinations to tackle the two major issues we've had in designing multi-drug combinations using in vitro studies and TB. The first challenge we've had to overcome is that this vast space was just not practical to, to measure. Just told you how we're gonna do that with diamond. The second problem is that we have a problem that many other disease systems have, which is that um, most of the growth conditions we use in a microtiter plate in, on the bench top um, don't give us results that are predictable to what happens in an actual animal. So most TB drug response measures are made in rich growth conditions, and it's not clear that those are actually useful at all in predicting what happens in an animal. So what we decided to do was to tackle them both together with a large data set and then to take a data-driven approach to tackle both of these problems together. Um, the way this works is to take with this incredible team of people in my lab who've um, spearheaded this project. It's taken a couple of years to gather all this data and do this analysis. We've taken T 10 TB drugs that we have the most amount of combination data for in animal systems. We've measured all single pairwise and three-way combinations. That's um, 175 combos in eight different growth environments in vitro that mimic different elements encountered during infection so that we can try and computationally merge those together to model what happens in different animal models. And with these, we get dynamic dose response curves. Um, one thing I want to show you, I'll kind of move quickly through here because I think we don't have very much time, is that in these eight different growth conditions, um, we get very different doubling times and the drug potencies are really highly dependent on both the drug and the growth condition they're in. So what this means is there is texture to be had in drug response if we make simple changes in our in vitro models. The next thing we did is look at our drug interaction space. 
So here I'm mapping the drug combinations that are across the top in our eight different environments. In red are drug um, combination antagonisms and in blue are synergies. And what I want you to see is that um, the drug interaction profiles are highly um, dependent on the growth environment and there is no single combination that's synergistic across all conditions, right? When you start a project like this, you naively come in and think, well, I'm just going to find a comp couple combinations that are synergistic across all my growth conditions, and we're going to prioritize those next for the combination space. Um, that's not what happened. So um, we went back to the drawing board. We took advantage of the fact that diamond measurements are a dose response curve is the unit of measure so that we could go ahead and derive potency metrics here. And those are in, in, in um, green. And we go ahead and then take a data-driven approach. So here we're going to use um, both supervised and unsupervised learning. We reassemble our data into a data cube that includes the combinations, the conditions, time points, and five different key metrics of drug interactions and potency. And we wanted to see whether there was a predictive signal in this in vitro data space that would predict outcomes in a mouse relapsing uh, model. And what we did is we started with just two different categories. So there's C0 in orange and C1 in blue. You're gonna see over the next couple of slides. Um, C0 is the standard of care or worse. And if a combination in an animal model was shown to be better than the standard of care, we mark it as C1 in blue. All right, so um, my approach is always to start with the simplest, um, um, clustering approach we can use. So we just started with a plain old PCA analysis. It's unsupervised. We just looked to see, is there a signal in the space, in the diamond space that would separate out based on C0 versus C1? So we color coded it after the fact. This is PCA, not PLSR. And you can see just even along PC1, this clusters very well. And so what this tells us is there's a strong signal that delineates combinations on whether they're going to be better than the standard of care or not. So that's a really great place to start. Um, and I have to say, we were surprised at how well this worked. We evaluated what these, um, what, the, what the metrics were that contributed to PC1. These are our loadings. We see a lot of lipid-rich environments here. And so that helps us understand which of our eight in vitro models are worth using. I'll point out that some of the in vitro models that we have, we dropped. So like our intracellular model, we dropped here because it's not predictive at all of what happens in the animal models. So we've dropped that model. The other thing that we found was really interesting is that the, um, the metrics are really driven by potency and not by the drug interactions at all. So you, the potency metrics here are, are shaded in purple. All right. So um, as an engineer, what I'm driven to do is to try and optimize how we design our experiments. So the next thing I wanted to do is to see if we could limit the number of growth conditions we make our future measurements in. So now we designed um, using different supervised learning methods. And here I'm showing you results from random forest models of designing classifiers of C0 versus C1 combinations using different subconditions of my eight growth conditions. So for example, this column here shows just the acidic and the cholesterol conditions, so two out of our eight conditions. I think this class is familiar with ROC curves and precision recall curves. Yes? Okay, all right, so I don't need to show you that. So um, the performance of these we were actually pretty pleased with, um, especially given how little data we, we have. We're really limited to the data that people have put in to gather all of this mouse, um, these really long-term mouse experiments. So we were pleased with this. And what this suggests is that we can use simple collections of in vitro models to make our measurements. So now we, can, we have a path forward to really reducing the number of in vitro experiments that we do to design and prioritize combinations using new drugs. And so that's what we're working on now. Um, and that's it. I think I'm out of time too. So what I wanted to say is we use not deep learning, actually, you know, as I said, in, in both of these cases, the simpler approach actually worked better for us to not only try and reduce and rapidly understand what to play with in the single drug space, but also to put a path forward on how to systematically 
ex and efficiently explore the combination space so that we can make the best use of these combination studies in mice. And the idea is to do systematic, efficient in vitro measurement using only invalidated in vitro models, right? So we need to throw away the idea of just using whatever is the easiest model to go with. Um, and that, that our combinations that are the best need to be driven by potency metrics rather than simple drug synergy versus antagonism. And that's it. I just want to thank the people in my lab that have really worked super hard on all of these projects. TB work is difficult and a little bit messy. Um, and so, um, you know, Jonah, Ni, nee, Yonatan, and Talia are on the Diamond team, and Trevor, Krista, Makila, and Morgan have been working on Morpheus. So thank you so much, Bree. This is really extremely, extremely illuminating. And again, once more, um, you, you're showing us the whole context within one little part, uh, within which one little part could be machine learning and deep learning and all of that. But you're basically telling us that it's a small piece of a much larger equation and that it's not necessarily always the right piece, which again is extremely important for our class. So thank you so much for doing this. It was a wonderful talk. And then uh, I look forward to more. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.